Okay, so it looks like most everyone is here. Um, the other ones can just fill in as we go. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me all right. Uh, say something if you can't. So, um, welcome to the Rhino Workflow Lecture of Beehive. My name is Emily. I will be um, presenting this today. And uh, I know previously James had introduced you to Rhino, so that's good. Hopefully you um, are still remembering some of that and using some of that for your projects. I don't know if you've gotten there yet, but maybe that would be good. Um, so today we're mostly going to go over like layer organization and how to make exploded axonometrics, which um, I hear is something that your professors will eventually want you to do. Um, so I will start sharing my screen. All right. So right now I have the Rhino file already open. So um, I'm sure all of you know how to, you know, start the app, click file open. Um, so a lot of this I had already pre-prepared. I'll, I'll be showing you all the commands and everything, but since some of these commands can like take a while to run or uh, if you have a complicated file, it can crash your computer. So I'm not gonna actually run them, but I will show you how to make all of the things that I have made here. So um, first off, we'll just go over layers quickly. So as you can hopefully see on the right-hand side of this file, I have two separate 3D models set up that are just copies of each other. Let's go to a perspective view so you can see that a little better. And let's turn off Arctic mode. Let's go to shaded view from the drop down up here. We'll double click. All right. So you can see one is already exploded and one is set up. These all have the same layers on them. So this is our original model that we're starting with. This is a project in third year. Don't be overwhelmed. It is a little complicated, but it was the best example I had. So um, this is how the model looks unexploded. And you can see all of the layers on the side here. I have them sorted out between different components of the building. So for example, everything that's part of this roof, well, I have it in a group right now. But if I were to ungroup, you can see that each of these strips is part of the roof layer you can find right here. Um, same with any of the structures and underlying walls. So it's always good practice to keep uh, multiple layers for different um, sorts of elements in your model. And that will definitely come in handy for making exploded axons. So as you can see on the side, I have layers for glass, roofs, arches, et cetera. So right now we're going to be trying to make an exploded axon of the structure mostly because that's typically what you're going to be showing in these kind of drawings. So how do we get to here from the original model? You're going to want to click on whatever you want your top layer to be. So in this case, in the top of my exploded axon, I have Two different roof systems. I have flat roofs and I have this big curving roof. So that's all going to be under my roof layer here. Um, so I'm going to hold shift and select all of these layers and then right click and select objects. So that's going to give me everything on the roof layer plus the gutter of the roof and the flat roofs which are the service roofs. So now that I have everything here selected as my top layer of the axon, I'm gonna go down to the bottom panel here and click Gumball. Um, I don't know how familiar you all are with Gumball, but um, as you can see, that brings up this um, little icon here. So that allows us to drag and um, move objects in any one of the axes. So that's going to help us in separating them upwards, which we're going to use this blue arrow for. And as you can see now, I selected everything on a layer, and these models have the same layers. So before I do this, I'm going to 
select this version, which is already done, and I'm going to type in lock so we don't bother that over there. So now we'll select these again and go to Gumball, which is already going to pop up since we have it selected now. And we'll click on the blue arrow, and that'll give us a dialog where we can type how far we want this, um, this selection to be moving in the um, upwards direction. So I believe what I used for the other one was 200 feet, and our units are already in feet, which you can see down here. So I'll just type in 200, and that will separate that. Um, something I like to do with exploded axons to make my life a little easier so I don't have to keep selecting all of these, is to group each, um, each different layer of the axon. So that will just allow me to click and move something whenever I want to without having to go back and select all the layers. So I have that here now. So now let's say the next layer I want to be these joists here, which again are, are very complicated and you, you might not be having these things in your projects in second year, but just for an example. So I believe I have them called Perlins on this layer, which is just another word for joists. So I'll select that layer, right click and select objects. And I will type in group again, just for convenience. And then I will hold in shift and select this layer as well. Go to Dumball and type in 200 again, which it'll automatically be there since that was my last command. And that's going to bring it up again once I hit enter. It takes a bit to load. All right, so that's looking pretty good so far. Now we're going to take these arches and pull them out so we can see them a little better. So we're doing the same thing. I have two different layers because there's two different uh, types of arches that intersect in this building. So I'm gonna select both layers of arches, right click, select objects. Um, I also want to select these purple columns here because those are um, attached to my arches, they're part of my structure. So I'll scroll down to the columns intersect layer. This time I'm going to hold control, so that'll just add one additional layer to my selection. And right click and select objects again. And I'm going to select these two again as well, so that when I move the arches up, it won't be intersecting with them. And use Gumball to move it up 200 again. And there we go. And now I have just the walls, floors, um, stairs, anything else that I don't really need to show in an axon so much, unless you're showing it and showing a sort of plan of your building, which um, they might have you doing, but typically it's just the, the structure of the building. So the one thing I do want to do with this, let's say I want to show where the building is placed on the site. So I want to separate this site down here. And in James's lecture, he probably, I believe he showed you how to make a site in Rhino, or that might have been Sean on second thought. But you've probably um, been shown this before by another member of Beehive. So hopefully you already know how to make this patch surface and um, extrude it downward so you can have kind of a block of a site that you can cut for sections later. So this is what I already have here. And this is already just one piece that I have like um, cut out of with the Boolean commands, which we won't be going over today. Um, so I don't need to group it or anything. It's just one solid piece and I can click Gumball. But instead of moving it up, um, I want this to be lower than the rest of the building. And it's easier to click on the site and move that down than click on the rest of the building and continue to move that up. So I'm gonna type in minus 200 and that's gonna separate that. And now you see I have some like weird curves here going on and I don't really want those to show up in my axon. So what I'm gonna do is type in cell CRV for select curves is the command. And that's gonna give me everything in this entire model. I don't wanna select this over here. Uh, you won't have to worry about this if you haven't used make duty yet, but you're just gonna hold in control and deselect that. 
So I don't want any of these curves to show up in my axons, so I'm going to type high. And there we go. And I did separate one more layer over here. I pulled out the surface roofs from the curve roof so you can see where those insert in, these little purple guys. So I'm going to ungroup this. Just type in ungroup. And then I'm going to go to the service roofs layer after I deselect, select those, and bring those up to 100 as well. So that will be where you get from the original model to this axon over here. Um, do you have any questions so far? Was that clear? Was that too fast? So next we're going to go into the view that you're going to take this axon from. So if you go up here, this is where you will see the different um, view options. So right now we're in perspective mode and you could also go into top view or any other views you want by going down to the set view option. So for this example, we're going to go in isometric and I believe this one was Northwest to get this specific corner of the building, which I think is the most important corner, and I want my axon to be seen from that direction. So isometric northwest. Okay, so what you want to be careful of when you're in this view is to um, not turn your view because right now it is in a perfect um, isometric view and you don't really want to mess that up. So if you happen to right click, oh, now I just messed it up. So you can, you know, spin it all around and now it's like, it's still parallel, but it's not at the view that you would want it to be in. So to fix that, you just repeat what we just did, set view isometric Northwest. So you can zoom and you can um, pan by holding shift and right clicking, and that won't mess up your view, but just be careful not to orbit. All right, so as you can see here, um, with this example that we just did, in this isometric view, it's all kind of clumped together, and that would be because we didn't space it out enough with Gumball. So if I were just working on this, I would go back and click on, well, I didn't group those apparently. I would click on the different um, groups that I made and just space it out at an even number with Gumball just to um, spread it out a bit. But for those purposes, let's say we did that right the first time, and this is our result. So now what we're going to do, we can do multiple things here to export this. So first off, we can export a shaded version, which can be an underlay for the lines that we're also going to export. So if we set our view type up here, to, you can do render, you can do arctic. Um, render will give you colors if you are setting materials, which you can do in the layers panel on the right side. Um, as you can see, for some reason, the only material I have set here is the site, which is like that bright green color. So I don't really want colors for this example. I also have some windows there, so that doesn't look too bad, but I don't really want that bright green site. and. Realistically, these arches wouldn't be white. So we're just going to do it in black and white. So for that, I typically use the Arctic mode. So we'll go up here and click Arctic. And that should be available in Rhino 6. I don't know if any of you have Rhino 5. I don't think that has Arctic mode. Um, but either way, rendered is pretty similar if you just have all the materials set to white. So if you don't have Arctic, that's another option for you. Also, as a side note, I would avoid clicking on ray traced. It tends to crash computers because it's like very detailed, especially with a complicated um, building like this. I would probably crash my computer if I clicked on that. So um, watch out for that one. All right, so this we can use for an underlay once we export the lines of the axon. And of course this is optional, but it tends to like clarify the picture when you have a lot of like complicated lines going on like this. Um, it, it tends to make it a lot sharper. So I like to use um, either the black and white shadows or the renders if I set materials. 
So the way you can export this, what I usually do is I type print. And I'm not actually going to print this because it tends to take a lot of load. So um, bear with me here, but I already have a printed version ready to show you. So as you can see, this is already lined up to scale because I did a practice version of this, but I'll show you how I got there. So this is the dialogue that comes up when you click print. Um, typically, I will use Adobe PDF. You can also um, print an image file. Um, a lot of the times, PDFs are faster than printing to an image, and it tends to be a smaller file, but um, a lot of them take a lot of load, so really, you'll like find your preference after a couple times of doing it. So I typically use PDFs, and right now, let's say I wanted to print my axon for a pinup and I want it to fit on an 11 by 17 sheet. Um, realistically, this axon is pretty complicated, so it would probably end up being on a bigger sheet, but for right now, we're just gonna say we want it to be on 11 by 17. So we're gonna select portrait because it is a long ways drawing, and we can select raster output if we're doing this underlay with the shadows, and black and white, um, it's already in black and white, but so you could just hit display color. And for some reason right now, it's not showing us what we want to show, what we want to print. So we're going to click window here, because that's going to give us an 11 by 17 window to put over our frame. And we're going to hope that it actually shows up like it's supposed to, <laughs> because it does say the window's over the drawing. So let's see here. As you can see, it's a little laggy because it's in Arctic mode. <laughs> so hopefully this works. And then I'm just going to click enter when I'm done dragging that around. Um, okay. So I'm not sure why the preview is not showing up. That's a little weird. But it should be fine. I'm not actually going to print it anyway. Um, yeah. So when you, when you set this up on your own, it, it should show up. So um, what I did previously to fit this on 11 by 17 is I found a scale so that I could also scale my lines that we're going to export later to the same scale once we bring it into Illustrator to adjust line weights. So right now it says custom. I figured out that if you have um, on paper as one inch, as 100 feet in the model, um, that would fit pretty well on 11 by 17. And basically the way I figured it out was going through these different scales and clicking on them. And if we had a preview that sh would show us, hmm, well, it would show us how that works. So basically, if you keep clicking on the different scales, it'll adjust the size of the image in your window. And once you find one that's like, you know, um, 100, one over 128 inches was too small, and then one over 64 was too big, so I went something in between and made it one inch equals 100 feet, which is not a typical scale, but for these purposes, um, it fits only 11 by 17, so that's what I wanted to use. So once you're done adjusting all these, um, you don't really need to do these if it's just an underlay, so I wouldn't worry about these other options here. It's mostly just the view and output scale and the destination that you're going to want to add. So I'm printing to PDF, 11 by 17, portrait, raster output, um, black and white or display color doesn't really matter in this mode because it's Arctic mode, so it'll be black and white anyway. And then I use window and you click set to drag that around and um, try to line it up. And usually it would show a preview of what we're printing. But Rhino is not cooperating right now. So we would hit print. I'm just going to hit close because I already printed that version. I can show you that here. So that is going to look like this. And as I mentioned, I printed to PDF. So we'll just see that a little bit. So this is what I ended up with. And as you can see, it doesn't have any curves on it. It's just the shadows of the Arctic mode. 
And of course, that's all optional. Um, that's just to give a little extra pop. So we're going to go back to Rhino and get off of Arctic mode, back to shaded. So now that's how we get the shadows. Um, any questions on that before I move on? Okay. All good. Cool. So moving on now to the lines. So I think James or Sean might have already taught you how to do this, but we're going to use the make 2D command. Um, I'm not actually going to run it again because it can crash computers and this is a complicated file, but um, just trust me when we get the result. So what you would do here, you could just drag over the axon you made. Keep in mind we're in parallel view and northeast or northwest isometric. So I haven't orbited at all. So this is the same as it's been before. Uh, and I see why it wasn't pretty now. I had locked this model. So I'm just going to type in unlock. That makes more sense. Let's see. <laughs> but it's going to show up now. Yep. All right. Now we know if something is locked, it does not show up in the print view. <laughs> so we're going to select all this since it is now unlocked. And you can type in the command make 2D. And that's going to basically, well, I'll show you the, the dialogue that comes up, even though we're not going to run the command. So you can leave these pretty much the same, this view. So you want it to stay in the isometric view. When you go down here to object properties, you have a couple of choices here. So if you click by output layers, or I'm sorry, from input objects, this will make everything on the same like Water layers, not export, like I have ours on the layer lines, I believe, since we have that checked off down here. So for bringing that into Illustrator, it really depends how detailed you want to be if you're changing the line weights. So um, I typically just use by output layers or from input objects because those will just combine all the layers because um, this is already kind of a complicated drawing as it is. And I don't want to get into changing every individual layers line weights. I just want it all to be pretty much the same. And then like, for example, if I want to like make the outline of the site a little thicker, I don't need all those layers to do that. I can just select them in Illustrator and it'll end up being a smaller file anyway when we export if you don't keep the layers. So that is what I'll typically do. Um, if you only have like five layers and you want, you know, you want the line weights to be different, then you can export with maintain source layers. And that will just allow you to change the line weights easier when we um, export in Illustrator. So I did two different versions to show you what that's like. Um, this stuff, I usually just leave the same. Um, hidden lines you definitely don't need because that's going to give you everything in the background that you can't even see right here. Um, and it'll all be dashed lines, so it'll look very confusing. So yeah, I almost never click that. And then honestly, I have not used any of these. So it's typically just tangent edges that you want to worry about. And as you can see in the bottom, it will give you a name. It's the name of your um, make 2D. So I already created two layers. So you can type in the name down here. I already have an axon with layers and an axon without. So I'll show you those. Let's close the 3D model drop down. So here are my two different make 2D axons. So once you run the make 2D command, you can see here we're in parallel view. These are the lines that come out of Make 2D. They look a little longer right now. So you want to go to top view to look at those. So double click on the view in the top left corner, and double click on top, or use the drop down, go to set view and click top. And so here's my two axons, the 3D models. And here is the Make 2D versions that came out of them. So as you can see here, one of these axons, the one on the left, doesn't have any of these layers divided, even though they're different colors right now. They're all on the curves layer. 
so everything's on the same. This axon on the right side, I can say, okay, I don't want to see my arches, so I'm going to get rid of the arch lines. And it basically functions with the same layers as my 3D model. But since we're putting these in Illustrator and, you know, I obviously, I want both of my arches to have the same line weights, um, unless you wanted them to be different for some reason, or you wanted like to highlight one of them in a different color, I would just use the, um, the option that combines the layers in make to do. So we're going to focus on this drawing over here, the one with the combined layers. And as you can see, I drew a couple lines here. So that's just to clarify um, where each piece is coming from. I'm sure if you've like looked up images of exploded axons or if you've tried to do something like this before, you'll see like the dashed lines that tend to like organize the image and they come to a bottom, usually at like the site or at whatever layers at the bottom. So that's what I drew here. And I made some of them lighter because you can probably tell this lighter gray one, which is on a different layer. Let me show you that. Here we go. So this is the, the axon without any layers. Everything's combined. I made a new layer called dashed, which you can go up to the top left here of the layers panel to make a new layer. I'm gonna undo that. Delete. So I made a layer called dash and then a sub layer, which is this button up here, to make a, um, um, what well, was sub layer, to the dash line, to do a lighter dash line, because this one, you can see it's called dash behind. So that is gonna be running behind a lot of the, um, the um, pieces that I'm showing of my axon. And I didn't want it to be too dark or as dark as these ones in the front because I feel like the one in behind is less important. You don't have to do that, that's totally up to you, but that is just how I would go about this. And you can see like the dash behind line doesn't go through because we want to show this as like a solid piece. And yeah, so these lines are not from Make2D, I just drew these, so I'll show you how that goes. Um, so I'm clicking so that I'm on this regular dashed layer and I'll type in line. And I'll click at the corner of one of these roofs, which fits into the curved roof. And you should be able to either turn this ortho on, or you can hold shift and that will toggle it on while you're drawing a line. And I will just connect this line down to there. And I think you're probably going to point out, hey, Emily, these aren't dash lines yet. We're going to get there in Illustrator. Um, you can make dash lines in Rhino too. But um, that won't always export the way we want it to. And since we're adjusting lines in Illustrator anyway, um, we're just leaving it for that. Um, if you just want to print from Rhino and you don't want to deal with line weights in Illustrator, that's fine too. You just go to line type and click dash instead of continuous in the layers panel. And then the only issue I ever have with that is sometimes the scale is very off. As you can see, I had to zoom super far in to see that. And you'll have to kind of play around with the scale when you're printing it to actually get them to show up as dash lines. But so I'm just going to keep this on continuous and we're going to edit that in Illustrator because it's a little easier to see. So um, anyway, as you can see, I held shift, drew a straight line there. Now, um, in theory, these lines should all be the same length. So I can just type in copy and I can draw the other corners. And so they're not quite the same length, which is probably because of the curve here, it makes it a little more complicated. So what I like to do, and you might have to turn off bump bolt to do this, is just drag the control point and hold in shift, and that'll um, move your line down. You can also use the command scale 1D, or if it's a line, you can just type scale. That's a little different and then click on the end that you want to stay in the same place, and then click on the end that you want to move, and then pull it up to wherever you want to move it. And there you go. So there's two different ways of adjusting your lines. And then we want to draw one of the lighter gray lines in the background here, connecting that to this corner. So I'm going to click on the dash behind layer and do another line. 
And we'll just click on that corner and hold and shift. And then it's intersecting right about there. And we'll hit. All right, that's done. And now that I turned Gumball off, sometimes it gets in the way of these control points, especially if it's the one on the bottom. So you can't grab the control points if you have Gumball on. So just turn Gumball off and click this and hold and shift and just drag it down so that it's not intersecting with this other piece. All right, so that's how you would make the dashed lines. And you could continue doing that for this side. Um, since I already have some of these started, I can just copy again. And let's say I want one here because that's a more important edge. One here and one here at this corner. And let's say I want one of these lighter ones that are going to be in the back of the building. Let's say one here and here. All right. So this will definitely look a lot better once we put it in the Illustrator. But just to show you how it would start in Rhino, and then you can drag, oops, that drag a little funny. You can drag the lines up if they don't quite reach where they're supposed to, or in this one's case, pull it down. And there you have it. So this would be enough. This is our Make 2D version with the dash lines added. Um, this is what we would export to Illustrator typically. Um, if I was being more precise with this, I would probably zoom in and make sure that there's no weird intersections like this. So this is an example. This is an example of one that I edited before. This is what I would originally want that intersection to look like. It's very clean. Um, you see, this is what came out of Make 2D. So sometimes you'll need to like fix that up a little bit if, if people are really going to be looking at it, if it's like a bigger drawing. Since this is such a small part of the overall drawing, um, I typically wouldn't bother with doing this unless you just really want it to look that much cleaner. So if you did want to go through and clean this up a little, you could just select all the lines and type in trim. And then drag your mouse across until you get the proper intersection. Because a lot of times Rhino um, will have different kinds of things going on with the shapes. Um, it's not super precise, and I don't think I modeled this super precisely either because it's kind of difficult to do that in Rhino. So sometimes you need to clean it up a little bit. And I could go around and do that on all of these if I wanted to, but I don't. So we're just going to export it like this. Let me save my file. Is that all clear so far? Any questions? All right. Oh boy. <laughs> Give it one moment to save. Okay. So now what I would do, this is our um, final version that we're going to export from Rhino. I would drag and select and go to the file panel and click export selected. And that is going to bring us to this dialogue where we are going to export as a DWG. So there's a lot of different options. So just scroll until you find AutoCAD drawing, DWG. You can also do it as a drawing exchange. Um, typically I just do it as a DWG file. And then you can type in your name for this one, I already have it exported because that command can tend to take a while too. So I have it a sample project, exploded axon lines. So uh, one important thing to note when you are exporting to DWG for Illustrator, you're going to want to click the options and this is going to show you like different export schemes that you can do. Um, typically default won't give you much trouble, but with Illustrator, you want it to be in lines or polylines. Um, and that will be sure to um, give you what you want for line weights. So I usually have it set in polylines in 2007. And that just goes for um, if you're ever exporting to Illustrator, if you're, let's say, doing a save as a uh, DWG, you're going to want to change it to like AutoCAD 2007 or something, or 
2013, I think, is also okay because Illustrator isn't quite compatible with the newer versions of AutoCAD. So just something to keep in mind, that's what that 2007 means. Okay, so we're gonna cancel because I already have the file. And we're gonna open up Illustrator and click open. And um, hopefully all of you know how to download the Adobe software to your computer. You just go to adobe.psu.edu and download the Creative Cloud and then that's where you'll find Illustrator. Or you could just use the uh, remote access for the studio computers. So this is my folder with all my Beehive things in it. So here's my drawing file that I just exported from Rhino. So I'm going to click open. So that's going to give me this dialog here. So a lot of times people will just click scale and fit to artboard. That's sort of the lazy option. Um, I would avoid clicking original size because that will give you a one to one scale, which will be like, I don't know, I think I measured this before and it was like 1500 feet high in the, in the um, X dimension. So you don't want that. You want to do the scale by option. Uh, don't worry about this percentage here unless you're like doing something like in half scale, you can type 50%. But typically I will edit these numbers here. So if you remember from when we printed the underlay version, I had it scaled that every 100 feet was one inch. So this doesn't really have a feet option. So there's your first hint of how to scale it properly. So this scale, this first number right here is showing you um, the units of the original file. So that was in feet. So I'm going to type in 100 there. And then this is going to be the units that it will be transferring to for Illustrator. So we're going to want that to be one inches because my scale was 100 feet equals one inch. And then that will line up with the underlay and it will also fit on an 11 by 17 sheet of paper like we wanted. Um, you don't have to check scale line weights. We're going to do that anyway. Um, the rest should be good. Um, don't check merge layers either, unless you really just want everything to be in the same layer, but I don't think that's necessary. We only have like four layers. So we're going to click open. And it's going to take a little bit to load. That's okay. If there are any questions so far, let me know. There are no dumb questions. Um, and also let me know if I'm going too fast. <laughs> okay. So I think your first, your first thought would probably be this is not exactly what we wanted because the paper is the wrong direction. So you're going to want to go to document setup oh, at the top here. And that's how you can change the size and shape of the artboard. So we're going to click edit artboards in the top right. You can ignore all this. And see that brings up this little tab up here. You could also do this manually, but it's a lot more accurate to go to the W, which is width and change that to 11 and change the height to 17. And that will give you an 11 by 17 artboard size which is exactly what we wanted. And then you can just click any of the other tools and get out of that option. So the, sec the second thing you'll notice is probably that some of these things look like they didn't show up. Well, that is because the lines are white for some reason. So they're just not showing up against the white background. So what we can do is select everything on the sheet and these are, these are different colors here, but they're not on different layers since we exported the simpler version. So that'll come in handy later, but just um, keep that in mind. So we're gonna make them all black because that's what we want in our drawing. So to do that, you go over here on the left side and you click this um, stroke option, the color, and you can drag this around. It was already on black in the bottom, bottom right corner, or bottom left, sorry. And you click OK. 
It might take a moment. And then if you click off of these, that will show you that all of our lines are now black. But if you zoom in a little bit, you notice that they're a little thick right now, like these stairs are just a blob. So we don't want that. We want them to be a little thinner. So we're going to select all of them again and go up here to where it says stroke. Or if that's not by chance up there, you can also go into the window panel up here and click stroke and you'll get a separate um, dialogue for that. Either way, um, you can just click this option up here and you get the same dialogue. Um, so the weight right now is 0 0.709, which I think is what it automatically does for PWGs. So you can move these arrows up and down and that will make the scale bigger or smaller. Um, if you move it down, it makes it zero. But then let's click one more, 0.25. That's probably fine for what we want for our purposes. So now you can see it's a little bit clearer with the line weights here. Um, these stairs are a little thick, but I'm not too worried about those. Uh, once we put our underlay under it too, it will be even more clear. So that's good. Um, one thing I am a little concerned about though is this part right here. So these are two separate lines, this, this black blob right here. And I want that to be visible. But right now it's, it's a little dense in just that. So let's say I wanted to just change these joist line weights. Well, this would have been easier if we would have exported with all of the layers, although the file would have been much bigger. But there is a shortcut to do this, if you, even if you export with the simplified make 2D. So I'm just going to click undo and make it so that we did not change all the colors. Let's see if that worked. No, oh, that was just the strip. So do undo one more time. Might take a moment. One more time. As you can see, Illustrator sometimes loads a little slowly when you have lots of lines. Okay. So now we're back to the original import. And let's say I just want these to be on a separate layer so I can select them separately and change their line weights. So you're going to do that by clicking on one of these lines, any one of them. And if you right or not right click, if you go up to the top of the screen and click select and then scroll down to same and fill and stroke or stroke color or appearance, any one of these will work. This is basically like a select similar command that you might be familiar with in Photoshop. So let's do stroke color. And that's going to select everything that's orange. The only problem here is it also selected this layer down here, which for some reason is the same color. Uh, usually I'll do all my layers in different colors in Rhino, but yeah, for some reason that happens to be the same color. So what we're going to do here is go down to the bottom right and click create new layer. That's going to put you automatically on this layer right here. And we're going to right click on our selection, which is all of these orange lines and do arrange and send to current layer. So that puts everything orange on a different layer, except it also includes this. And I don't really care about this. I just want to change the line weights for the joists. So what I'm going to do is lock all of the other layers, which are just all our solid lines and all our dashed lines. And then I'm going to click this little circle up here to select everything on that orange layer that I just made. And then I will hold and shift and just select all these lines down here. So none of those are in my selection anymore. And then I will, um, you could do this multiple ways. You could have selected the inverse and then put those curves that I didn't care about back on the other layer, or you can make another new layer and just put these curves on that one. Either way it works. So now these are on the pink layer. And you can see they're on their own and they aren't on the same layer as the orange curves anymore. So now we can click this little circle again, select just these. Um, before we do that, we're going to want to change everything to black again and to the lighter stroke color. So let's put these at 25. Ah. 
Ah, everything was locked. My bad. See, this is how I would actually work through this. <laughs> so trying to be realistic here, you're gonna, you're gonna do silly things like this while you're in the middle of working. So put all the strokes back, put everything to black again. The difference here is that we have our joists in a separate layer and now I can make those an even lighter line weight by going to that layer, clicking the circle, and then changing the stroke to let's say 0.1, which is very thin. And then that's how you can distinguish these little lines. And again, that's a little messy. Um, if you really cared a lot, you could clean that up, but it's so small that people aren't really going to see that anyway, so I would just leave it. And then we can change our dashed lines, which are on these two layers, with dashed and then the lighter dashed lines. And go into stroke, click this checkbox here for dash line. And I think six was the dimension I used before. So that just determines how big the dashes and gaps are. And I think that looks pretty good. All right. So and then if I wanted to, I could go into this, which I, if you remember, was the lighter lines, the lighter version. And I could either change the color or put the opacity down up here. So let's change the opacity to 50. And then those will be a little bit lighter. And you can tweak that around as you want. All right. So this is uh, mostly complete. And you could export it like this. But what I like to do is bring in that underlay. So I'm going to click File and Place. And I'm going to find the image. So that would be this one, exploded axon underlay, which is what we had printed in our Arctic view. And then I'm going to make a new layer for that. And you can see, like, as my, on my cursor, it has that image. So I'm just going to click anywhere on the screen. Um, if you drag it, it will start to scale it. We don't want to do that because we made sure to scale to the same size as the underlay. So it should line up pretty perfectly. Um, and then you would just drag this until it's at the right spot on your drawing. I think that's pretty good. Yeah. And as you can see now, it just makes it pop a little bit more with all the shadows down here. And in the arches particularly, it just makes it look a little cleaner. And again, you can like go into these and clean these up, but we're not gonna do that for these purposes. There's also, oh gosh, oh boy, <laughs> my computer's freaking out a little bit. There's also, as you can see, there are some like little errors that I had edited, edited while I was um, cleaning up the drawing. So what you can do is go to the rectangle tool, double click on the fill and make it white and just kind of put a white rectangle over these things just to hide them. And as you can see, that's on the, um, well, I'll put that on the batch one layer. You probably want to put that on the same layer as the axon underlay itself. And that layer you're going to want below all the lines because if you put it above, it might start to like blur some of them out. And you don't really want that. Right now it's not doing that, but that's just good practice. All right, so that's pretty much it. And then if you wanted to, you could create another layer and add text with this um, tool right here, the type tool. Just drag a box here. And let's say here's my aluminum roof cladding. Well, there we go. And then you could add labels as such. And I already have an exported version that is finished for you. So you can do a file and export or file and save as, either way. Um, let's do export as. And you can export that as a JPEG or a PNG if you want an image file. You can also do save as. And that is how you would export to a PDF right here. And let's do that because that's a, that's a pretty common way of doing this. So we're just going to do finish two because I already have a finished example to show you. And this will bring you to a dialogue 
that basically uh, what you're going to want to take from this is whether you want to preserve the layers or not um, so that it's editable in Illustrator. So that would be this checkbox right here. And say so that's the most important part of um, saving it. If you wanted to um, continue to edit, edit it in Illustrator later, or if you wanted a smaller PDF file, you would uncheck that. And then you just click Save. And let's see, this is our underlay. So let's open the finished one and see how it looks. After we had added all of our labels and cleaned it up a little bit more, and then it would turn out something like this. And again, this is a little more complicated than what some of your projects will probably look like, but that is totally okay. Uh, don't feel intimidated by all the craziness going on here. All right, so that is about it. Uh, does anybody have any questions for me or they don't have to totally relate to the assignment. You just ask me if you're like looking how to do something in Rhino that's maybe kind of related or anything I might have missed or gone too quickly over. Anyone have any questions? All right, cool. Well, I will stop sharing and I'm gonna put my email in the chat. So if you do have any questions um, that you think of later, you can email me. It's eet5101 at psv.edu. You can also email on the Beehive website and that'll get around for me if you title it with this uh, lecture. So yeah, if there's um, no questions, then you're all free to go. If you have a question, feel free to stick around. Thanks, everyone. Hope that was helpful.